It's our pleasure to uh, have uh, Professor Ibert uh, to give us a talk today. So Professor uh, Ibert now is a, a associate professor in the Department of Industrial and uh, Manufacturing Engineering uh, at Penn State. And he received his PhD degree in Operation Research from uh, Columbia University in 2011. Okay, so uh, Professor uh, Ibert's research mainly focuses on uh, first-order methods for solving large-scale uh, constraint optimization problems uh, from many uh, areas, including uh, machine learning, uh, distributed optimization, uh, robust matrix decomposition, uh, convex regression, uh, compressive sensing. And recently, uh, his research involves uh, design and analysis of randomized uh, primal dual algorithm for solving set of point problems. Uh, you will see what work today. Uh, and uh, uh, for decentralized method on solving multi-agent optimization uh, with complicated coupling uh, constraints. So his work uh, has been supported from uh, uh, NSF, uh, ARO, and uh, ONR uh, research grants. So today uh, he's going to talk about a, a primal dual algorithm uh, with a line search for solving convex concave set point uh, problems. So, so now I give you the control. Oh, uh, thank you, Yang Yang. So, uh, yeah, I would like to thanks, uh, thank you, Yang Yang, for inviting me. Uh, it's a really great pleasure to be here. Uh, I mean, here in the sense that I'm virtually here and uh, talk about my research. Um, today, um, I will, as Yang Yang mentioned, I will uh, talk about an accelerated primal dual method uh, with a uh, backtracking for solving convex concave settle point problems. And um, this is a joint work with my former PhD student. Uh, Alpha. Now this year uh, he started uh, as an assistant professor in the University of Arizona. Um, so um, I please, uh, if you have any questions during the talk, please. Uh, I don't know what what your format is, but if you want to ask questions, that is perfectly fine for me. You just go ahead and ask me. Okay. So. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, so the um, here. Uh, today I'll be talking about settle point problems. Let's quickly go over what they are. Um, so suppose X and Y are finite dimensional vector spaces and uh, we have a, a function L uh, defined over X and Y and uh, it can map to uh, uh, extended reals, it maps to extended reals. And our objective is to minimize L uh, over X and maximize, uh, maximize it over Y uh, jointly. So <clears throat> um, here um, we, uh, I'm going to define what a settle point is. Uh, X star and uh, Y star is called uh, a settle point uh, of the function L. If fixing X star, uh, Y star maximizes, you see uh, here X star is fixed and then Y star maximizes. And then, and simultaneously fixing Y star X star minimizes. Okay, so these type of uh, uh, these type of points are called settle points. Uh, settle points. And our focus is on uh, convex concave settle points, uh, settle point problems. Here we assume that uh, the function L uh, is convex in X for each fixed Y, and it is also concave in Y for each fixed X. Okay. So uh, the example, the figure on the bottom uh, is just like uh, showing you an instance of this case. Um, as you see, uh, the, um, the function L is x squared minus x times y squared plus y, uh, y squared plus one. Since the y, comp the y part it always will be positive, uh, so x squared minus x uh, is a convex function. And, and um, when x takes values between 0 and 1, so note that x squared minus x will be negative, uh, that, that term. So therefore, it's a concave function in y. Okay? For each fixed x, it's a concave in y, and for each y, it's convex in x. So if we uh, look at from the direction, like uh, if you look at the um, uh, zx plane, you see uh, every uh, contour line here, the, every contour line here, they, they, it corresponds to different fixed y. 
so as we see for each fixed y, the contour line uh, is a convex function in X, okay? Uh, and this guy at the top is the saddle point, okay? And why this is the saddle point? Because it really minimizes this, this contour line in X, but if you look at from the uh, YZ plane, uh, here each contour line corresponds to different X's, okay? And then, uh, and for each fixed X, as you see, this is a concave function of Y, and this is that guy that maximizes in terms of Y. Um, so this type of problems uh, arise in many different settings, uh, but one classic example is the uh, regression problem. Uh, so the classic regression, linear regression, uh, you are given data matrix X and then some noisy responses Y, let's say uh, the, the, the noise is like Gaussian. So one thing, uh, one way to construct a model function, uh, 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 model beta is to uh, minimize the residual, right? So you minimize the two norm. And, but the problem with this approach is that uh, this, this uh, model is sensitive to the outliers. As you see here, because of these outliers, uh, the, the green uh, curve is like tilted to the left, right? However, our eyes, uh, if we know that these guys are outliers, uh, our eyes can tell us that this is a better fit, right? So, <clears throat> so therefore, um, one technique proposed uh, is like the robust regression, where there are different versions. Uh, you can consider the uh, uncertainty in the responses, but here in this model, the uncertainty is uh, is, is is assumed in the uh, in the data matrix X. So here, this is like an uh, X is like in an ambiguity set, the the perturbation in an ambiguity set U, and then you want to fit the model beta in the worst case. Uh, worst case scenario, this would be much uh, robust to outliers. So, and if we fit that model, then that model is something that we guessed, okay? So it just like ignores the guys outside and then uh, fits to that problem. So as you see here, this is a min-max structure. So, um, <clears throat> so another problem is uh, from machine learning is uh, SVM, support vector machines. So suppose that here uh, AIs are the futures, uh, uh, future data, and then they are n-dimensional. And then we have labels. Uh, so BI is either minus one or plus one. This is a classification problem. So we train, we come up, the, the idea is we try to come up with a, uh, in a sense, separating hyperplane, okay? So we want it to separate, but of course, uh, because of noise or some other things, uh, the, the data can shift to the other sides, okay? So this is why what we want to do is that uh, we are going to use this soft um, uh, soft margin uh, SVM. And, and uh, so we are allowing these type of uh, points that are lying on other sides. But then uh, this term here, okay, this term tries to minimize such things are happening. Okay, because this, this zeta i uh, is positive only if the point lies on the uh, incorrect side of the hyperplane. And, and um, so the, the main idea is you want to come up with a, a separator in such a way that the margin, okay, this margin, or maybe that margin is maximized, okay? So as you see, that margin is two over norm of w. So to maximize that margin, then we are minimizing uh, Norm of W square. Okay, so this is, I mean, uh, this is the classical uh, SVM problem. Um, uh, but so uh, sometimes the, the, the data is not like this one. Okay, it's not easily separable with a linear separator. In that scenario, then uh, people have used kernel trick before. And the kernel trick is then what you do is uh, you, uh, you embed the data uh, uh, in a higher dimensional space usually, so, so that there you can separate the data there and then you take back the, uh, and then which means if you, you find the uh, linear separator in the higher dimensional space, uh, which would correspond to a nonlinear separator in the original space. Um, <clears throat> uh, maybe I should be quick here. So the only change here is that 
then instead of using the uh, future vector a, then we use this uh, mapped features. Okay, uh, but the, the the problem with this approach is that uh, usually this this phi function is not known, uh, psi or psi function is not known, uh, and and then then what is proposed is that uh, writing the problem uh, in the dual formulation. Uh, you will see in a second. Um, but then in the dual formulation, you will see this inner product. Okay. But um, so instead of uh, instead of uh, knowing psi function, what we are going to say is that we'll be searching for a, a desirable inner product. Okay. Because each inner product will be um, uh, given by some positive uh, semi definite matrix. Um, okay. So. <clears throat> So this is not the SVM problem. In, inside is the dual SVM problem. Okay, so inside is the dual SVM problem. Here, what I'm I'm, I'm talking about uh, kernel matrix learning problem. Um, so if if you fix a kernel, forget about the outside mean. Okay, if you fix a kernel, and if you solve the inner problem, this is nothing but the classic dual SVM. Okay, dual uh, support vector machine problem. Uh, for fixed inner product, but uh, now I'm gonna consider a, a saddle point problem. The saddle point problem is let's say we don't know what inner product we should use, okay? And we want to come up with an inner product. This is corresponding to uh, picking a future map, okay? In such a way that uh, so the data is explained better, okay? So therefore this outer problem is like trying to uh, minimize uh, the error because of the strong duality so the dual objective function value is equal to the this misfit in the in the primal problem and then we are to here we are trying to come up with an inner product uh, such that uh, the data is explained better so as you see here this is another uh, this is another settle point problem <clears throat> Uh, so while trying to search for a, a separating boundary, we at the same time we try to uh, design an inner product. Um, so, yeah, maybe I should be quick uh, with these things. So, um, so one example is that uh, so let's say we implemented uh, this method, uh, our method to solve this settle point problem, uh, the kernel matrix learning problem. And uh, we use the MNIST data set. And the, uh, the, the problem uh, was classification of digits 4 and, and digit 9. So here, each digit is, like, uh, is a picture, 28 by 28. And, and the training data size, uh, we took uh, 6,000 uh, images, like you see there, an example. And then the test data size was uh, 1,500. And so the issue is, <clears throat> If you use an interior point method, uh, like, like the classic uh, methods, any one of the shelf methods, without really uh, uh, exploiting the structure of the problem, then each iteration, uh, the complexity is uh, cubic in the training data size. However, when you go for uh, first order methods, then uh, the cost goes down to uh, quadratic. Uh, okay, and here M, I didn't explain it here. Uh, but M is at the top you, here. You see, I'm using different inner products, uh, different kernel uh, kernels. One is the Gaussian kernel at the last one, the third one. The second one is polynomial kernel, quadratic one, and the and the and the K one is the regular one, regular inner product. So in the in this problem, maybe I should. Uh, so what I did was, so we choose K as a convex sum. Maybe I should write this. We choose we we try to write K as like Y I. Ki, okay, and then and then the, the the outside problem we try to design wise, design wise uh, to minimize over k's. Okay, so um, and what you see is that theoretically we know that Sidumi or interior point methods will beat us eventually, of course, because their convergence rate is uh, like linear. Uh, ours is like uh, sublinear. But uh, in this example, in this practical example, it turns out that 
it really looks like ours is like a linear rate. But anyhow, so as you see, um, uh, this is a relative error. And then the relative error is like uh, 10 to minus 6 already and uh, in, in a very quick time. So we know that uh, a, a first order methods uh, are favorable compared to interior point methods if you're searching for low or maybe medium to low accuracy solutions, and which we see in this example as well. So, I mean, just to show you, since, uh, okay, since uh, our per, per iteration complexity is low, um, here in this example, let's say, if we uh, stop training uh, without obtaining the optimal solution, if we stop training uh, in 50 seconds, then, um, then you see um, the the test accuracy is like relatively like very high compared to the um, interior point method because the reason is that uh, as you know we can take many more iterations uh, in the in the given amount of time compared to the um, interior point methods. So um, so and then what I mentioned here about the ticks and the uh, crosses is that uh, if you stop the model and if you try to, these are coming from the test data, and if you try to uh, classify them correctly. And if you see, um, as these numbers shows, we, our model uh, classifies, I mean, our, our inexact solutions classify pretty well. Um, okay. <clears throat> um, I'll, this is the last example I wanna uh, talk about uh, of several point problems. So let's say we're interested in, um, in this like maximizing the capacity uh, of communication channels. Uh, so this is a problem from information theory. And um, so here, so each channel has the signal power, let's say PI, which we can design, we can select. And then there is an adversary. An adversary uh, is trying to interfere with our communication. And then uh, the adversary can choose the uh, interference power QI, okay? And we have, let's say, n different capital N different communication channels, and all these guys are uh, communicating with a single receiver. Here, uh, in the information theory, the uh, channel I capacity is uh, the unit is bits per second uh, is is given by this formula. This is uh, Shannon Hartley uh, formula. This is B I is the bandwidth, and and as you see, P I here, uh, what happened? P I is is the is the signal power. And QI is the interference uh, power. And then sigma I is the receiver noise, okay? This noise could be, uh, this is not the, uh, in, the adversary can pick with. This is given. Sigma I is the uh, natural noise that is uh, existing in the uh, environment. So the problem here is that we want to allocate the signal power uh, to communication channels in such a way that the total signal power we have is P. This is our budget. Uh, but the adversary's um, uh, job is to uh, allocate the total interference power Q in such a way that uh, it uh, minimizes our communication capacity. So as you see, this is like a two-person two game. And um, so this is the adversary's uh, objective, tries to minimize the total capacity. and and we as uh, and we try to maximize the capacity. So this problem is another example for convex concave settle point problems and where uh, the coupling function, as you see between P and Q, uh, is nonlinear, okay? Okay, so uh, let us go back to the uh, problem setup. Um, so the L function uh, for which we want to find the settle point, we are assuming, has, uh, assuming that there's a certain special form. Uh, which is fx plus uh, phi of xy. This is what I will call from now on the coupling function, and then minus hy. The assumptions are um, f, uh, uh, f and h are convex functions. They are possibly non-smooth. And we are assuming that these functions, f and h, has um, simple proximal maps, okay? And, um, and the convexity modulus of f is denoted by mu, okay? We are, we are going to uh, investigate two different scenarios. When mu is zero, which is f is a merely convex function, 
And we're also going to investigate the uh, rate of the uh, algorithm, behavior of our algorithm, when mu is strictly positive, okay? which, which corresponds to a strongly convex scenario. <clears throat> and as I said, um, our assumption uh, uh, on, on, on the coupling function phi is phi is convex in X and concave in Y uh, with, certain, um, with certain Lipschitzian properties, smoothness properties. Um, so what we assume is that we assume that the partial gradient uh, of phi with respect to x is is Lipschitz, okay, for every fixed y, okay. Note that only x is changing, okay. Only x changes, but the y is fixed, okay. And um, and so here the Lipschitz constant we assume to be LXX. So the convention is this: the first x shows you what the uh, the partial gradient with respect to, and the second x tells you what is the changing argument, okay? Because we use the same uh, the same convention uh, to denote these Lipschitz constants, Lyy and Lyx. Again, the first one tells you what the gradient is with respect to, and the second one tells you what the argument is changing, which argument is changing, okay? So note that Lxx and Lyy, they can be zero, Still, this is a non-trivial saddle point problem, as long as Lyx is non uh, Lyx is positive, because if Lyx is zero, which means there is no coupling, and then the saddle point problem reduces to two optimization problems. If Lyx is zero, then and then which means uh, you need to minimize uh, f and you need to minimize h separately, right? Two different problems. So a generic example. Another example that uh, this uh, settle point problem shows up is the uh, constraint convex optimization problems. Um, and uh, this is a fairly uh, general problem. Uh, we try to minimize the composite convex function. What I, and, and here, both f and g are convex functions. And I'll assume that f is a simple proximal mapping and g is smooth, okay? And here, g, uh, this G uh, is a smooth function, uh, and it is a, uh, it's a multivariable function. It's, 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 uh, as you see uh, right here, it is mapping to RM, okay? And um, so, and then we are assuming that this G function is K-convex. So this is a generalization of convexity. Uh, this, this is defined by the um, uh, partial order uh, induced by the cone k, okay? So it just generalizes the convexity. Uh, you can you can uh, always think this as something like this, okay? This 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 conic inequality generalizes uh, uh, the the right hand side one, and um, so the assumptions are uh, pretty standard. So um, in a sense, I mean, uh, so we assume g is uh, Lipschitz continues, and it is also smooth, which means we're assuming that Jacobian is uh, Lipschitz, and K is a closed convex cone. So this problem uh, includes uh, uh, LPs, uh, uh, QPs, QC, QPs, STPs, and nonlinear forms of those problems. Uh, so what you can do is, uh, using the uh, Lagrangian duality, uh, we can uh, dualize, uh, we can dualize these constraints, and uh, what you need to do is then the dual variables you take from the uh, dual cone so that uh, this inner product is uh, here is um, um, negative, okay? Um, so the dual cone is defined here. Okay? So, but anyhow, so when you look at the, uh, this, uh, this form here, uh, uh, this is, we are minimizing in X and maximizing the over uh, the dual variables. So this is exactly uh, in the form we want. Um, so you see this is a special case of the problem we considered. But what we are going to do is, we are not going to treat this as the coupling function. We are going to also collect G and this together, okay? This is our coupling function. The reason is, remember, because we assume that F has a simple prox, okay? 
uh, this smooth function G may not have a simple prop. In that scenario, then you combine these two guys together, okay? Because what we're going to do is that we are going to uh, linearize this coupling function, okay? We'll be using linearization both in X and Y, okay? So now, um, so, and then H is the indicator function of the dual cone, okay? So uh, long story short, uh, these, uh, these, these uh, constraint uh, optimization problems can be cast in the form of uh, several point problems. Uh, and one thing I, I, I want you to notice is that the coupling function here, uh, this coupling function here, uh, for Lagrangian dual problems, okay, it is always uh, affine in the dual, okay, because of Lagrangian duality. It will always be coupling functions coming from constraint optimization problems will always be affine in the dual. However, when the constraint is a nonlinear function, then it will be nonlinear in X, okay? So it is nonlinear in X, but it will always be affine uh, in the dual, okay? Okay. <clears throat> Um, so there are many related work. Uh, this table, of course, doesn't uh, do justice, but um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to summarize those ones that are very closely related to our work. And, uh, and uh, Yang Yang has also done uh, many important uh, uh, things uh, in terms of constraint optimization. Um, so in this table, uh, I, I try to separate these things using the first column. Uh, because when the coupling function, this phi of x, y, when the coupling function is bi bilinear, okay, which means of this form, k, x, y, there are many problems, uh, signal processing problems that fits into this form. Uh, there is a, a large amount of body of work. This is this four of them, only few of them, okay, uh, for the bi bilinear setup. And in that bilinear setup, uh, when the f function is merely convex. Uh, the complexity of uh, one over epsilon uh, has been shown. Uh, by the way, I didn't oh, I didn't tell you the metric. The metric is, uh, in some sense, you try to uh, call it. I, I I didn't specify exactly, but call it an epsilon settle point. Okay. Uh, later, uh, when if time permits, we can. Um, I can give you the precise definition of an epsilon settle point. Um, so <clears throat> here, uh, there are the last two works here, okay, uh, by Sean Bald Polk and uh, Malitsky and Polk. Uh, they also have a, 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 an accelerated rate when the uh, when the f function is strongly convex, then the rate improves to one over square root of epsilon, and especially the last work. Uh, by Malitsky and Polk has a backtracking, okay? I was telling to uh, Yang Yang before, so backtracking, when you do primal optimization, uh, is, it is not as complicated as the uh, backtracking when you, when, you, when you treat primal and dual step sizes separately, because you will see that primal and dual step sizes uh, for several point problems will, will have a nonlinear interaction. So if you try to change one of them, you need to carefully adapt the other one. So therefore, uh, I believe this work uh, was pretty uh, inspiring and it inspired us to design our method. But all these, all these things, as I mentioned, they are for bilinear setup, okay? And um, so, uh, and here uh, for constraint optimization method, uh, Yang Yang um, uh, has this uh, 18 paper, I think the name was Inexact ALM, Augmented Lagrangian Method. Uh, and here Yang Yang also show uh, 1 over epsilon, and he also get the rate 1 over square root of epsilon up to a log factor that is perfectly fine. And, um, and, and he also um, has another uh, paper, as far as I know, this is the linearized augmented Lagrangian. So the difference is here, um, uh, uh, the, 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 there's like, uh, you solve uh, augmented Lagrangian problems inexactly. So there are two loops in the in this one, and but here 
uh, he this is a single loop algorithm you linearize the augmented Lagrangian function um, and um, okay and uh, so these these three works are for constraint optimization but there are also other works um, uh, by He at, uh, and others Kolosowski and Montero and Judutsky uh, and and by Malitsky uh, all of them like as you see all these things uh, all these works in this table they got one over epsilon and um but in the non-bilinear setup okay here we are talking about non-bilinear setup p is uh convex in x and concave in y uh, and i just take back it is affine in y okay when it is affine in y and strongly convex in uh, uh, f f is strongly convex then there are two works that show uh one over square root of epsilon result. One, one is ours and the other one is by uh, Juditsky uh, and Nemirovsky. And, uh, but this method uses restarts. Uh, it is a multi-loop method. Uh, it calls the uh, mirror prox algorithm in a, uh, in, a, in a loop. So our advantage uh, compared to their method is uh, ours is a single loop method uh, which just runs in a uh, single loop. And moreover, uh, I'll, as I will describe here, uh, we can utilize backtracking. And backtracking will be really helpful in practice. As you see, and it won't change the uh, complexity uh, by up to, a, it, it only changes by up to a constant. Oh, by the way, so uh, Ouyang and uh, uh, Dr. Xu, they show that indeed these rates this one over epsilon and one over square root of epsilon rates, they're indeed optimal rates uh, for the corresponding problems because uh, they they show that uh, these, these 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 upper complexity bounds for our algorithm matches the optimal uh, lower bounds uh, matches the uh, lower lower bounds for bilinear settle point problem. Okay, so. Um, the the algorithm uh, is so this is this is not the algorithm yet. So if uh, if you take if you look at this algorithm, okay, uh, in this version, so here this dy uh, and dx they are uh, Bregman distance functions. Okay, uh, for the sake of simplicity, you can assume them to be uh, maybe let me write here. You can assume them to be y minus y x square so uh, these are the special versions okay uh, if you for 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 special uh breaking functions you can consider them to be of this form okay anyway so if you look at this then uh, this algorithm what it does is that in the in the dual variable it does gradient ascent you see this is the gradient function if you solve this uh, the second step is nothing but gradient ascent and the third step is nothing but gradient descent so this is a gradient descent, gradient ascent algorithm. And here, uh, sigma k is the dual step size and tau k is the primal step size. So what we did was, um, we, we modified gradient uh, ascent, gradient descent algorithm in a minimal way. So what we did was, um, we just added, okay, we just added this momentum term. So, um, the the dual and the dual uh, uh, direction is is uh, is like augmented with this term. Okay, so this is uh, this looks like Nestor acceleration, but it is not because Nestor Nestor acceleration uh, is 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 done um, over the iterates. So in fact, when uh, phi is bilinear, then it it has a taste like uh, Nestor acceleration because then theta goes inside. Uh, uh, but here, uh, the the momentum term here uses the partial gradients. Okay, this additional, this 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 naively uh, looking uh, addition uh, changes the complexity guarantees of the algorithm significantly. Um, so, oh, by the way, um, if we assume a more stronger oracle, uh, we can remove this assumption. Okay the Lipschitz assumption on the partial gradient of x. So in fact, certain problems doesn't satisfy this assumption. An example, 
uh, consider the coupling function x square y, okay? X uh, is x is in a bounded region between minus one and one, but then y uh, comes from the set, an unbounded set, y greater than or equal to zero. In that setup, lx x won't exist, okay? Um, um, so although we although we assume that uh, partial gradient with respect to y is Lipschitz, since uh, the the whole the whole thing may not be Lipschitz, okay? And in fact, the gradient may not even exist. Um, so this modification is following by Kolosowski and Montero's work. So the steps are very similar to what I described previously. So this is like the, without this term, without this term, this is the, this part is the gradient ascent. This term, okay, the difference is that previously we were using linearization here, remember? We were using, instead here now, we don't linearize. We don't linearize, but we uh, just plug y k plus one. Previously, we were linearizing uh, this. But now, this is why I said, now this is a strong row record. We need to solve a harder problem. But uh, if, you, if, if, you, if your oracle can handle this type of problems, then you can, you can remove uh, this Lipschitzian assumption here, okay? Um, Okay, <clears throat> so let me tell you about the, um, uh, the theoretical guarantees of this method. Um, so this is the uh, step size conditions, okay? Step size condition for the prime land dual step size. This is what uh, I was mentioning. Uh, as you see, the, the relation between tau and sigma, it is highly nonlinear. You see this relation? So that is why I was telling that if you try to modify one of them, you need to carefully modify the other, okay? Um, and there's another condition here, okay? So, but the theory says that if you, if the, if the, if the problem uh, we are focusing on is the convex problem, which is mu zero, okay? And then you can choose the step sizes, primal and two step sizes and constant, uh, they don't change, and the uh, momentum parameter is constant, set to one, and uh, and if the uh, fixed step size is satisfied this condition, then you can show that the iterate sequence, the actual iterate sequence, uh, it converges to a uh, settle point. One thing that I need to uh, emphasize here is that uh, there may not be a unique settle point because we are in the convex concave setting. Everything is merely convex, merely concave, okay? There might be uh, multiple settle points, but still the algorithm, uh, depending on the initialization and the step sizes, picks one and converges there. This is a, there is a unique limit point of the sequence. And, um, and moreover, this is uh, this function, okay, this difference, and here this x bar k and y bar k are the um, ergodic sequences. It's like the time averaged iterate sequences. Uh, this gap, okay, this difference uh, diminishes by one over k. So before I move on, uh, before I move on, I should say that if the prime land dual domains are bounded, okay, if the prime land dual domains are bounded, then uh, if you take the supremum uh, over the bounded domains, maybe I should say x and y over uh, y and and both sides x x and y in y then uh, since they are they are uh, they are uh, bounded sets compact sets then this side is 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 your o of one constant okay and in fact one can show that uh, this is a gap function if it goes to zero then uh, then 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 the um, then these guys are converging to uh, a settled point as well. It, it characterizes how uh, how good of an ex, uh, approximate settled point you are in. Um, but anyhow, so since we I, we already showed that even the sequence x k y k converges to the um, uh, to a settled point, of course the ergodic sequence should converge to the same, same point as well. So this result was for the um, for the convex setup. For the strongly convex setup, uh, we assume that 
uh, mu is uh, strictly positive. And then the uh, Lipschitz constant here uh, for the LYY, which is we are assuming that this, this means that we are assuming that uh, the coupling function is affine in, in, in the dual. Okay. This looks like a, a special uh, setup, but as I mentioned you before, in constraint uh, convex optimization problems, in constraint optimization problems, LYY will always be zero. Okay. And then, and then if you use uh, the Bregman distance function, this one, and um, then the rate can be improved to one over k square, okay? From one over k to one over k square. But here you need to use uh, changing step sizes. Here, uh, since mu is positive, so as you see that theta k, okay? So theta k uh, is an increasing function and it, it goes to one in the limit. And and because of that, as you see, tau k, tau k is a decreasing function. It goes to zero, and sigma k uh, is an increasing function, increasing and goes to plus infinity. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, the rates are tau k is uh, theta one over k, and sigma k is theta uh, k. Okay. Uh, this, these step sizes are coming from uh, shambhold uh bilinear paper, and we in the, indeed that 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 uh, choice also works for us. And uh, because of this one over k and k, this is how we get one over k square here. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to uh, mention that this step size condition our step size condition, generalizes the existing step size condition for uh, Schambolpok. Schambolpok, as I mentioned to you, in 16 paper, considered a bilinear coupling, okay? And their step size condition was this. So you see this this guy, okay, this guy, okay, uh, is, is analogous to this, okay? Why? Uh, because if you he, if he set the coupling function as this, then LXX is LG. LG is the Lipschitz constant uh, of the gradient of G. And LYX is the norm of K. So this is basically, those two things are equivalent to each other. And LYY is zero. Since LYY is zero in their setup, in this setup, okay? So they don't have this condition, okay? This, they don't have this condition. Um, so but what I'm uh, saying uh, in summary is that our steps as conditions uh, is a, is a general, uh, generalized version of the conditions uh, Shambhal Pope gave in their papers. Now, uh, let's, uh, let me talk uh, briefly about the uh, back checking uh, that I mentioned earlier. So the, the, the main challenge uh, in these problems uh, usually are, uh, yes, we assume that LXX, LYY, LYX exists. And usually you can assume that they exist, uh, but uh, we may not know them. They may not be available to us to be used in the algorithm. And what is uh, more challenging is that for constraint optimization, uh, in, uh, sometimes this LXX okay, may not even exist. The reason it may not even exist is that uh, the, the dual domain may not be bounded. And Unless you know a bound on the dual optimal solution, which you, which if you, if you know, then that is fine. But if you don't know a bound on the dual optimal solution, then uh, and if the dual domain is unbounded, then then you have a problem. This guy creates you a problem. So, <clears throat> an example here: uh, consider a, a simple uh, QCQP. Uh, here, if you write down the problem. Uh, in the settle point form, then I write the Lagrangian, and you see then we use this uh, dual variable, okay? Then uh, this is the dual variable, okay? Then we use the dual variable. Uh, so then if you write down the Lipschitz constants, okay? So then I'm writing the, so this is corresponding to LXX, okay? So this will mimic LXX, uh, this guy. So if you note that, then there is norm of A0, norm of A1, and then this 
ugly, norm of, uh, sorry, absolute value of y comes there, okay? So that is why when the dual domain is unbounded, then this this guy, uh, you cannot immediately get a, a, a delicious constant LXX. Um, <clears throat> so instead, what we did was we came up with a test function. So this test function, I know it looks complicated. Uh, I don't want to go into details of this test function, but what it does is that it tests uh, whether uh, given primal step size tau k and the dual step size sigma k uh, is admissible, okay, if the weather they are admissible. So we um, came up with some, uh, these terms, surrogate, these, these terms uh, uh, mimicking the role of LXX, okay, the first, the first guy, okay, this guy is mimicking the role of LXX. This, um, uh, in, in convex optimization, uh, uh, since uh, phi is um, convex in X and, 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 and it's smooth in X, then uh, this, this, the first one that I use here is related to this descent inequality, okay? Because um, this would be bounded by, if this guy exists, uh, it will be bounded by XK plus one minus XK, okay? Norm squared, okay? So that is why I said uh, this is mimicking somehow LXX, okay? Um, the, similarly, uh, this part, as you see here, this is like L by X, okay? It's like mimicking L by X, the second, the second one here, this, this. Uh, and the third one is mimicking uh, the role of L by Y. But the good thing is that we don't have these constants here. Instead, uh, the cost is, we are computing, uh, and in fact, we are not computing. We already used those uh, gradients before. We already computed them before. The only problem is that if the test function, we are, we, I'll show you the test. This is the test. We are going to plug them here. If the test is not satisfied, uh, if, if the test function gives you strictly greater than zero, then uh, as, as you will see in a moment, then we will adapt the primal step size you compute XK again. So therefore you'll compute these gradients from scratch again, okay, for the new point. So that is the downside. So which means you're, you're gonna do more Oracle calls. Um, but what I want to um, emphasize here is that uh, just focus on, uh, just focus on this, this test function, everything is computable. Uh, you don't need to know some uh, weird constants. This C, uh, C alpha, C beta is something that you choose, okay? Uh, there is nothing uh, unknown here. And you just check this. You just check if the test function less than equal to zero. If, if so, then everything is fine. If, and the intuition that we can upper bound, we can upper bound uh, the test function divided by sigma k with the right hand side, okay? This, this term here, okay? These uh, highlighted terms, if you if you remember, there uh, I cannot expect you to remember, of course, but they are related to the uh, those step size conditions. These guys, okay, they are related to step size conditions. So, um, therefore, even if we don't know what LXX is and LY is, okay, even if we don't know them, if we assume them, they exist, okay. If we assume them, they exist, but we don't know them. Then, uh, by looking at here, you can easily argue that these things, okay, these inequalities will eventually hold if I, uh, if I decrease tau k uh, sufficiently enough and if I increase sigma k uh, sufficiently enough, okay? I mean, if I decrease uh, tau k sufficiently enough, this, these things will hold, okay? So, which means that this condition will terminate eventually. The problem is then we need to count how many backtracking steps we need to do in total. Uh, to bound overall complexity. So this is the this is the algorithm uh, with the backtracking. So this part, the middle part, uh, is is the part that I already mentioned to you. This is the um, if the, if you didn't have backtracking, then this is what you would use. Okay, you call it the main step. What is happening here is that uh, there is this gamma k. Okay, the, uh, this is like a parameter. And just look at how gamma k is updated. What is happening here is that whenever mu, 
whenever mu is positive, then gamma k is increasing, okay? And therefore, since gamma k is increasing, sigma k is decreasing, and 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 tau k because of this, and tau k decreasing. On the other hand, if mu is zero, look, if mu is zero, then this term is gone. So which means gamma k's are all equal to each other, okay? So which means sigma k is not changing, tau k is not changing, okay? Um, so this is this is the only different part. So here, uh, what you do is you test test function. If it is violated like this, then uh, you decrease the primal step size, okay? But after you decrease, of course, as I said, you need to adjust, okay? Uh, you need to adjust the um, uh, other parameters correctly. So at the end, one can show that for the convex scenario, when uh, the f function is merely convex, um, then the rate is still 1 over k, okay? Still 1 over k. Um, and you still have the convergence, okay? Um, and uh, for the strongly convex scenario, then mu is positive and the LYY, which means the dual, in terms of dual variable, the coupling function is FI. So then you get one over K square rate, okay? So, but this part tells you, okay? This part tells you how many iterations you do, okay? So this, these parts are related to how many iterations you do, okay? But what we are saying is that the number of inner iterations, okay? for each outer iteration, not, I mean, like for each iteration is bounded by this constant term, okay? I mean, um, so doing backtracking just uh, affects the overall complexity by a constant. And one more thing that I should mention is, um, we don't need to use monotonic steps, uh, monotonic decreasing steps. So if you remember, we were updating tau k like this and, 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 and gamma k was increasing, okay? Gamma k was increasing. So since gamma k was increasing, so tau k's are uh, decreasing to zero if mu is greater than uh, zero. So therefore, uh, this, would, this would somehow uh, affect the uh, practical performance of the algorithm. But we can show that uh, since this term is larger than one, we don't necessarily need to monotonically decrease the primal step size. Uh, we can update this uh, primal step update rule with the, with the new one, okay? And if you do that, then for the convex scenario, nothing changes. The asymptotic rate, asymptotic complex is the same, one over epsilon, one over epsilon. The only thing that is changing uh, is for the strongly convex case then you get an additional one log one over epsilon. But uh, this one works very well in practice because what is happening is that you're using the local Lipschitz constants and, and moreover, uh, you're taking larger primal step sizes. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I, 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 I unfortunately, I think, I think I'm uh, almost running out of time, but I just wanna mention to you the thing that I told you before and the issue is when you do uh, constraint optimization, okay? When you do constraint optimization, uh, so you have this uh, GX inner product with Y. And so your inner product function is, I'm sorry, your coupling function is GX plus inner product of GX with Y. So then if I look at the LXX, okay? As a function of Y, then you would see the norm of Y there. So as long as the duals are not bounded, okay? This would cause you a trouble this guy, okay, the form. So then we investigated the scenario in, in a couple of cases. If uh, a bound V such uh, on, on Y star is known, then you can simply set LXX to be, you bound it by, by B, okay? You bound it by, by B and then you use this. But the case one is usually not easy uh, to know, uh, I think. So the second thing is, if the dual bound, okay, is not available, so what's happening? So then here, if LXX exists, but it is not unknown, it is unknown, then the algorithm, APDB with backtracking just works. Because you know that the inner iterations, uh, this backtracking will eventually terminate, no problem. 
So that is the interesting scenario. When even now I'm going to consider when even LXX doesn't exist. It does not exist. So what you do is uh, you just, as you see here, we just switch uh, X and Y. We previously, we were updating Y first. Now we update X first. By doing this switch, we were able to do uh, an induction analysis. And then we were able to show that uh, the supremum of the dual iterates are bounded. Okay, the, the, the dual iterates, they are bounded. So therefore, you don't need a global Lipschitz constant. You don't need uh, the Lipschitz constant for every y. It's enough that you look at the trajectory of the algorithm. And then you can you can define your LXX uh, using the soup here, okay? Uh, along the iterate sequence. And so therefore, since it exists now, you don't need to know it. We, we are not assuming that we know this supremum, but we, the only thing that is enough for us is that it exists. So therefore, uh, then APDB works, okay? Um, so we implement our method on uh, uh, quality constraint quality programs. We have a very limited amount of time. And um, so we just uh, solve, as I said, QCQPs. Um, so we looked at relative suboptimality, okay? So this is the relative suboptimality, and this is the uh, uh, feasibility violation, okay? And uh, we look at the convex scenario and strongly convex scenario. Um, so we compared uh, with this uh, PEGM, this is by um, uh, Yuri Malitsky, and this, this, this algorithm is for, in fact, variation inequalities, but since it's more general, of course, it, it, it works uh, for our setting as well. And this is the linearized uh, augmented Lagrangian method uh, by uh, Yang Yang Xu. So I just, uh, I need to be fair here. The, 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 the thing is, so uh, all of them, all three methods, they use uh, backtracking. However, uh, both APDB, our method, and PEGM, uh, we are using uh, non-monotonic step sizes here, okay? This is why uh, we were able to obtain a better practical behavior, like D and both PEGM. Uh, in, in, in a linearized ALM, uh, the step size we choose is like the, we pick the uh, pre previous primal step size. This is, this is why uh, the behavior is like that. So the, if, if somehow one can use a non-monotonic step size here, I, I think this, this method will perform better as well. Um, and, and we also looked at the strongly convex scenario where we did was uh, we picked the uh, eigenvalue of the objective function uh, in such a way that it is one. So the condition number is not that good. So the condition number is 100. It is almost not like a nice strongly convex problem, but still. So this is the algorithm. And the black one is like the one that, that doesn't use constant step sizes, that exploits the uh, strong convexity. And this one is uh, doesn't uh, consider strong convexity and uses constant step size. But still, as you see here, uh, we see a significant improvement, okay? Um, um, yeah, and then uh, we also tested the problem on uh, this kernel matrix problem, but I just don't wanna go into uh, the details here. So it's better if I uh, answer your questions if you have some. Um, yeah, this is where I should stop. Uh, so yeah, we compared again with uh, some interior point method uh, and then uh, and with the uh, variation and equality method. So uh, APDB, uh, APD just works fine just well. And um, so uh, all the things that I mentioned here um, uh, can be found in these two papers. And um, so the second, so the, the, so the second one, is just an implementation of the primal dual method that I just mentioned here for distributed optimization. So for those who are interested in uh, distributed optimization, uh, they can see how these type of methods can be implemented there. Okay, so I talk too much and maybe too quick. Uh, sorry for the uh, maybe not being clear at, at some times. So but I can take your questions. Okay, thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, 